is Friday night. It's about six o'clock in the evening, March the 8th. And we were just listening to this album right here. This is Donald Bird. The name of the album is called Royal Flush. Let me show you the album cover. It looks like he's playing a little five card draw, if I'm not mistaken there. So that got me inspired to put my name on the list 413 at Bellagio. So we are about to jump in the car and head down to the strip and grab a seat at a 1 3 table and get into some poker action. March the 8th, Friday night at Bellagio. I will see you all at the table. All right, we are back in the action back at Bellagio on a Friday night and we pick up King Queen of Clubs in the small blind. Under the gun player puts in the $3 call, middle position player puts in the $3 call, and then it folds over to a player in the low jack who puts in the raise. He makes it 15 to go. Cutoff is quickly out of there, and the button is quickly out of there, and now the action is back to me. I have a prime candidate here for a squeeze play, and a squeeze play is what I do. I raise it up. I make it 55 to go. Big blind doesn't think too long before letting his cards go. Both limpers go ahead and fold. And it's back over to the player in the low jack who now goes into the tank. The wheels are spinning in his head. He is trying to decide what to do here. And of course, I am praying for a call. I do not want to see a raise. That would be bad. We would have to make a decision if he does decide to put in the raise. But he is not letting his cards go into the muck. So I'm thinking he's going to be putting in the call and we're going to be getting a little action here to get things started on this Friday night. But after some deliberation, that is not what happens. He decides he's gonna go ahead and just let his cards go. He puts in the fold. We don't get any action here, but we do make a nice squeeze play to get things started and get things moving in the right direction here on this Friday night at Bellagio. The action is heating up here at Bellagio. We talked the table into doing a $10 bomb pot every dealer change, and this is the first bomb pot of the night. We pick up ace-10 offsuit in middle-ish, late-ish position. I don't know. Positions get a little muddy in these bomb pots. Eight players, and we go directly to a flop of king of hearts, six of clubs, ace of hearts. Checks to me, and I think I want to start betting here. I want to get value from any worse aces, any flush draws, any straight draws, or maybe even a king X hand that wants to put in a call. I make it 45 to go, and we pick up one caller who's in late position. Player that I've played with. About maybe half a dozen times here at Bellagio. I know him pretty well. He does play a little sticky, little, uh, little, little hard to get rid of. So he might have a pair. He might have two pair here. I don't know. Ranges are infinite in these bomb pots. So it's a little hard to, uh, to narrow it down. I check and he checks it back and we see the jack of clubs on the river. I don't think there's much merit in continuing to bet here. If he wants to bluff at it, I'll let him bluff. But I check. He checks and we end up winning with a stronger ace when he shows ace eight. So we probably missed a street of value there. We probably could have bet maybe on the turn and picked up another call. But as played, we win this bomb pot and we keep things moving in the positive direction here. Two hours later. What feels like an eternity of folding preflop, we finally pick up a playable hand. Pocket eights in the low jack position. We see a limp from under the gun. Middle position player gets out of the way and now the action's on me. I make a mistake here, I limp in, I just call the $3, I know, this is terrible. This is always a raise. Don't do this here, guys. Don't do this. Everyone else gets out of the way, and it's over to the big blind who now decides to just check his options. So we're going to go three ways to a flop. We've got the big blind, under the gun, and myself in the hand. A flop of 9-3-3, two diamonds. Big blind decides to start things off here. He bets $10, and under the gun goes ahead and puts in the $10 call. I call as well, and we are going three ways to a turn, which is the king of clubs. Big blind slows down now and checks, and under the gun player checks as well. I just check back, and we go three ways to a river. The river is gin. It is the eight of spades, giving us a rivered set. A very disguised rivered set, although it is going to be very difficult to get value, considering that we did not raise pre-flop. The pot is not very large. But Big Blind does decide to bet again. He leads out for 20. Under the gun, plus one player gets out of there, and now the action is on me. I, of course, am going to be raising. I want to try to squeeze out any value that I possibly can out of our river set here. I go on the larger side. I make it 80 to go, just trying to get any type of call that I can. 
Unfortunately, the big blind pretty much just snap folds, and we end up taking down a relatively small pot here with our river at set. Really passive pre-flop play coming back to haunt me here on the river. Had I raised pre-flop, there would have been a lot more money in the middle. It would have been a lot easier to get paid on this river. Thankfully, we don't have to wait nearly as long before we pick up another playable hand. This time we've got the pocket jacks, the fish hooks, and we are in middle position. We see a limp from under the gun. He puts in the $3 call, and now it's on me. And I raise things up, and I announce a $12 raise, and I throw out $12. And for some reason, the player to my direct left here now starts to debate the raise. I don't remember exactly what his reasoning was here, why he thought this wasn't a valid raise, or what he thought the issue was. But he's trying to get the dealer to declare that it's not a valid raise, but they say the raise stands. He puts in the call, and then it folds to the small blind. And because of the debate with the player to my direct left, now the small blind is confused about the raise. He's asking the dealer if it's a $12 raise and if the raise is a valid raise. The dealer is confirming with him multiple times that it is indeed a valid $12 preflop raise. Eventually, finally, after further clarification, the small blind puts in the call, and finally the under-the-gun player who limped puts in the call. So a lot of confusion here pre-flop. We end up going multi-way to a flop that's pretty safe for us. It's 762. There are two diamonds out there, so there is a flush draw. Small blind checks, and the player in the under-the-gun spot checks. I continue betting here. I go for a $30 bet here on this flop. Player to my direct left gets out of the way. Small blind gets out of the way, and then it's back over to the player who is in the under the gun spot who limped. And I'm hoping for at least a call here. It would seem like, you know, maybe somebody would have a hand like pocket nines or maybe even pocket eights that might put in a call, but that is not what we get. Everyone folds. They're out of there. They don't have anything. They missed. So we end up taking down a small pot here with our pocket jacks with some confusion pre-flop. Let's see if the ladies treat us any better than the jacks. This time we pick up pocket queens in middle position. We see a limp from a player under the gun. She puts in the $3 call, folds around to me, and of course I'm going to be raising it up here. We've got a premium holding. And just to avoid any further confusion, I just go with a $15 raise. Three red chips. No red chips and blue chips. Just three red chips. Really easy. Folds now around to the player who limped, and she puts in the $15 call and we are going to go heads up to a flop. Flop is not the best for our exact hand, but not terrible for our range. We see the ace of spades, nine of clubs, deuce of clubs. So when the player who limped in checks it over to me, I think a continuation bet here in position is in order. And that is what I do. I fire out for $17, and she doesn't think too long at all before just folding. So we don't get any additional action here from our ladies. Probably didn't want too much action on that board, but maybe one call would have been nice. We find ourselves with another pocket pair. This time it's pocket tens. We're moving down. We're going through all the pocket pairs. Jack, queens, now tens. I'm in the low jack and it folds over to me. I raise it up, I make it 12 to go. Ends up folding over to a player who is in the cutoff who puts in the $12 call. This brings along the button who puts in the $12 call and everyone else in the blinds gets out of the way. So three ways here to a flop, giving us an overpair. We see a pretty safe board, 965 rainbow. We are out of position and going to be first to act on this flop. I think with our overpair, we can continue to bet for value. We can get called by pairs. We can get called by draws. So I make it 20 to go, and only the cutoff puts in the call. We are off to a turn, which is the deuce of spades. A total brick shouldn't change anything. If we had the best hand on the flop, we should still have the best hand here on this turn card. So I continue to bet for value. I make it 35 to go. Once again, the cutoff doesn't think too long before putting in the call. He definitely has some piece of this board, so I'm just praying for a clean river card. Something that doesn't change the dynamic of the board, but we see the seven of diamonds. That brings 40 with straight. I don't think we can continue to bet here for value. I go ahead and check with the intention of probably check calling depending on his sizing here on this river. He does announce a bet. He says $45 and he counts out the chips and slides them out over the bet line. Now the decision is over to me and this is a very value-ish sizing. We're getting better than four to one on a call. Really seems like he wants a call. 
And the more I think about this, and I've looked at this after the fact, I really don't know how many bluffs he's going to have in his range here. I mean, what is he really going to be doing this with? Is he going to be doing this with, like, Broadway cards that he called down twice? I don't think so, right? He's probably going to have hands that uh, connect with his board, straights, two pairs. But we are getting an amazing price. We do have a bluff catcher. I don't know if our hand is just too good to let go here, getting the price four and a half to one, almost four and a half to one on a call. So I end up talking myself into a call on this spot. I go ahead and put in the $45 call. And we get shown the bad news right away. He turns over pocket eights for a rivered straight. If you want to see me make more bad river decisions, consider subscribing to the channel and liking this video. Amazing. This is the next night, Saturday night. We're at a different table, a new group of players, and I pick up ace jack of clubs in the cutoff. I'm curious what you all think of this hand. This is an interesting one. I raise it up to 15. Player on the button puts in the call. The button had been calling every hand pre-flop, so he's got a really wide range here. Blinds get out of the way, and a player who limped in the hijack, he had been limp folding every hand. He gets out of there. He folds. We go heads up to a flop. Flop is king 8-8. Eight, eight. Paired board with a king on the board. I think this is better for our raising range, but I've been experimenting with checking out of position a good chunk of my pre-flop raising range to see how the player in position responds. He goes into the tank after I check here and is thinking and thinking and thinking. I don't think he's got too much. The more he thinks here, the more it leads me to believe that he does not have much of a hand at all in this spot. Or maybe he's just overthinking with a hand like an 8. So when he bets 15, I go for the check raise here. I decide to bump it up and make it 45 to go. Just really targeting all of the weak junk in his range, trying to bluff him out of the pot. Although I could be bluffing here with the best hand. This sends him into the tank. And I mean, he goes well into the tank here. This is like a 30 to 45 second tank on this check raise. And I don't know what the heck he's thinking about. If he's got an eight, more than likely he's just going to be calling. If he's got a king, he's going to be calling. If he's got a hand like pocket nines or pocket tens, I don't think there's any harm in folding here. If he's got a hand like pocket jacks, I don't think there's any harm in folding. He could have a hand like a weak king that he's deliberating on, like a king six or king five or something of that nature, deciding whether or not it's good enough to call. I don't know. Curious to hear all of your thoughts and how you would analyze this player's range in this spot and what he might be deliberating on. But eventually, after quite some time, after quite a lot of tanking, he finally decides to go ahead and put in the call. I was getting to the point where it was you know, going to be a clock situation here on the flop. It really shouldn't take this long to make a decision on the flop, but it does. And he goes ahead and puts in the call, and we go off to a turn. And the turn is the queen of diamonds. So another card that I feel like is better for me than it is for him. But I put on the brakes here, and I decide to slow down and check. And I think... I think this is a mistake. I think I should be continuing to put pressure on him here. Considering how long he took on the flop, he's probably not that strong. But I do check. Curious to hear if you think this is a good check or not a good check. Let me know your thoughts on this one. He checks back, and we go to a river, which is another king. It's the king of spades. So now if he did have that weak king that he was thinking about on the flop, he's got trips. And I don't think I can continue to represent here after I slowed down on the turn. So I just go ahead and check, trying to get the showdown and hoping my ace high is good. I tell him I have ace high, and he turns over queen of hearts, nine of diamonds. Well, now it makes sense what he was tanking with on the flop. He had absolutely nothing. So, yeah, makes sense that he was thinking about it for so long because he did not have anything at all, and he went ahead and put in the call. So... Kudos to him. He ends up hitting his queen on the turn, and he takes it down when I slow down. I don't think he would have folded, though. If he's calling with queen nine on the flop, he's probably going to continue to call when he hits a queen on the turn. On to the next one, and let's see if we can do better. Last interesting hand of the session, and last interesting hand of this episode, we pick up pocket sevens in the hijack. We see a raise from middle position one player. He makes a 10 to go. I call 10, and it folds over to the small blind who puts in the three bet. He makes it 31 to go, and now it's back over to the middle position player who calls 31. 
giving me a pretty darn good price here to call and see a flop. So that is what I do. I put in the $31 call and we are going to go three ways in a three bet pot in position. And better yet, we see a flop that comes down seven of diamonds, deuce of diamonds, three of clubs, giving us top set, giving us the nuts on this flop. Small blind starts things off with a check. And it's over to the player in middle position who originally raised for 10. He now fires out and he goes big. He goes $100 on this flop, leaving himself only about another 120-ish behind after this bet. So I am praying here that I can get him to put the rest of it in. I go ahead and isolate all in here. I jam it all in. And if the small blind wants to come along, hey, I've got the nuts right now. Feel free. Put in the call. But he snap folds, and now it is back over to the player in the middle position who starts to tank a little bit. And I get a little concerned that he might be contemplating a fold here. I don't know how he can fold. I don't know how he can put in $100 here and then fold for another 120 ish after the $120 bet or the $100 bet. I just feel like he's got a call. And eventually he comes to that decision because he goes ahead and puts his chips over the line. He puts them in the middle. And we're going to go to a run out, and the run out is clean for us. We see the nine of spades on the turn and the deuce of clubs on the river giving us a boat. We show our full house. He instantly mucks, and we end up taking down this nice pot with our flopped set of sevens to end the night on Saturday night. We ended up just a little bit. We were in the game for quite a bit. So it's nice to get even, though, when you flop a big set here to end the night. Hope you guys enjoyed the hand. Hope you enjoyed the episode. I will see you all in the outro. All right, that is going to do it for this episode. I'm recording this outro two weeks, almost two weeks, after I played these two sessions at Bellagio. So this episode covers Friday, March the 8th, and Saturday, March the 9th. Just a couple of hands from, from March 9th. And today is Wednesday, March the 20th. So I have been slacking on my vlogger duties and I'm editing this episode late and I'm recording this outro late. So I need to hold myself more accountable and stay focused on my vlogging. That's the, uh, the takeaway here. So over these two sessions, I ended up winning like 22 bucks, nothing really notable, no big win, no big losses, basically break even poker. Uh, happy to be in the green, obviously, but uh, would have preferred to, to see some bigger gains. But I did have a lot of fun playing these last two sessions. The tables were fun. The attitude was loose. People were laughing and talking. And when you're a recreational player and you you know you play part time as as a hobby, having fun at the table and having a fun table can be just as important as winning. So I feel like that's a win in and of itself. So shout out to everybody I played with during these two sessions. And that is going to do it for this episode. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did please consider hitting the subscribe button and hitting the like button. It does help me out here on the channel a ton and it inspires me to continue to make future content for all of you to enjoy. And that'll do it. I will see you all in the next episode. I hope you're all well. Good luck at the tables. Take care.